Thank you for the introduction, Mark andre So today I would like to introduce you to Extra P, a performance modeling tool developed together um, from the TU Darmstadt and the ETH Zurich. As you all might know, there is a big spectrum of uh, performance um, analysis method ranging from uh, full-blown benchmarks over simulations to model simulation and models. And uh, usually with benchmarks, of course, you can um, cover a large number of application parameters and uh, you have a small model error in general. But on the other hand, um, usually they are very expensive and they require a lot of work and time. Um, on the other hand, models are you can generate models pretty fast, but usually you get a higher model error, of course. So extra P is over here in the modeling domain. And um, the motivation behind extra P is the identification of latent scalability bugs um, in uh, parallel codes. Um, so let's imagine we are a developer of a parallel application and we um, and we developed it and now we want to test it. So usually we start to test it on a small system represented here by this picture. And um, then we will test the application and uh, execution time will be really small in general. And this will run fast. And then of course, in the next step, what we want to do is we want to scale the application and run it on a bigger system. However, uh, in many cases, uh, that hides uh, unpleasant surprise as suddenly we get uh, really long execution times and often we're not quite sure why this is happening. So this is the, uh, um, the motivation behind extra P to identify these uh, latent scalability bottlenecks. So what extra P actually does is um, it creates a scaling model that is a representation of a performance metric. For example, the um, for example the runtime of a specific function um, as a function of the number of processes. So, for example, here in this uh, graphical representation, you can see a scaling model um, as a function of the number of processes on the x-axis, and on the y-axis, you can see the runtime depending on the number of processes. And that will give you basically an insight how the program behavior uh, will be at different scales. So of course, there's now different models or um, approaches to obtain such models. One of them would be analytical performance modeling. And then you can basically uh, identify kernels or specific functions of a program that dominate the performance at larger scales. And usually you do that uh, via um, either small scale tests or the intuition of the developer if he already has an idea how his code will behave. Um, however, that process usually is quite laborious um, since it requires manual analysis. And also um, it requires that you have the necessarily necessary expert knowledge um, that you can actually do this analysis. So the general disadvantage of manual analysis is that it's really time consuming and is also quite dangerous to overlook um, some functions or kernels in your code, especially if the code is relatively large and complex. Um, so what we do is uh, we call it automatic performance modeling. And um, we take uh, arbitrary um, parallel program as the input here symbolized by these uh, codes with a random main function, a few methods, foo, bar, compute, etc. And then we instrument these codes and we instrument all functions of it and um, conduct a few performance measurements as you can see here. And based on these performance measurements, extra P takes them as an input 
and automatically um, create human readable uh, performance models. So these scaling models that I introduced earlier. And it will create you a graphical interpretation, as you can see down here, and also a mathematical function that gives you an impression of how the performance behaves um, as a function of the input parameters. So our primary focus um, of extra P is on identifying scaling trends and ranking these scaling trends. So usually a common performance analysis chart that you can see in a paper looks like this, um, where it's often really clearly visible um, how the scaling trend is for each um, function. However, um, actual measurements in laboratory conditions more look like this. So you can see it's already harder to identify uh, scaling trends. Um, in real production environments, however, you have system noise, OS noise, uh, you need to share um, your network bandwidth, et cetera, with other jobs. So in reality, um, your measurements, for example, for runtime will look much more like this. And then it becomes much harder to identify uh, accurate performance behavior. That's why our main focus is on identifying scaling trends. So now, how do we um, create our models? Uh, of course, we always model two things. On the one hand, computation, and on the other side, um, communication. We do this by uh, using certain building blocks um, for our performance models. First of all, we have a, a constant building block that just simply represents a, a constant value. And then we have a logarithmic building block and a polynomial building block. And finally, we can combine all of these building blocks with each other um, to build more complex terms. So extra P is called uh, is uh, based on a, something that we call performance model normal form. Uh, the performance model normal form is basically functions like a primer. Um, on one hand, it allows us to build um, using these building blocks that I showed you before uh, to create the performance models. And on the other hand, it restricts um, the search space of our um, approach. So as you can see here, the performance model normal form features again, these building blocks. So the constant over here, the polynomial term and the logarithmic term, and allows us um, to, st to stack them behind each other so we can have multiple of these terms. And we can also restrict um, their exponents. So by um, setting certain sets for the exponents here, for i for the um, polynomial term and j for the logarithmic term, we can basically specify the search space we want our approach um, to look into for creating the performance models. And um, then during the modeling process, we um, create this search space and create potential hypothesis for our scaling models. These hypotheses basically look like this. So there are again combinations of these building blocks. So for example, a performance model could be just a constant um, or a constant in a polynomial term and or basically a combination of all of them using also the different exponents uh, that we specified here in these sets. So again, depending on the exponents that we choose and the number of uh, terms that we allow per parameter, this search space, as you can see, is either um, quite small. Oh, sorry, it can be either quite small or it 
can become very large actually. So in order to create the performance models, our workflow looks like this. Of course, in the beginning, uh, we need to start with um, the performance measurements. Um, after conducting our performance measurements, um, we can use them to create, uh, to lo load them into extra P and create our performance models. So in order to um, create the performance models, we use our um, performance model normal form again, um, um, create our uh, search space, and then basically use our measurement points to fill in um, the parameters values here. And then we can identify via um, linear regression and some other methods the best exponents, basically we can identify the best hypothesis in this search space. And then of course we do some statistical quality control um, using the measurement points that we have and can determine, determine how well um, our selected models, our created models fit on these um, measurement points. And in, if we decide that the fit is good enough, uh, we will use these scaling models uh, to do perform further performance exploration. For example, we rank the kernels to identify a um, scalability bottlenecks. If we are not satisfied with the accuracy, however, we can do further refinement and, uh, for example, add um, more terms as shown here um, to get more out of our measurement uh, data and try to find a function that fits the measurement points even better. So extra P um, relies on a few assumptions and limitations. Uh, so first of all, um, only one scaling behavior for all the measurement points. Um, the problem of course is that we are uh, very much like bound to the information that we get from our um, conducted performance measurements. So if there are, let's say jumps or bumps in this um, performance behavior, as we can see here on the right side, um, it becomes really hard to identify um, the scalability trend. Um, such behavior, for example, could occur if we have um, MPI operations that switch their algorithm um, based, for example, on the resource allocation that we use um, for our jobs. So behavior like that you can see here in this graph. So for until two to the power of eight processes, um, we used a certain algorithm and then it suddenly switched. And after that, we, instead of a logarithmic behavior, etc., for example, we see a linear uh, behavior suddenly. And that's quite a challenge for our um, modeling approach. However, we can solve that problem, but that um, requires that we have um, much more measurements, so to say, so we can actually identify um, when this behavior is changing right here. Another thing that's quite difficult um, are changing growth trends. Um, so we do our uh, ranking of the created functions um, based to growth rate. Um, however, if you take a look at the figure here, it's quite difficult to figure out um, actually which function has the bigger growth rate. So depending on how far uh, we zoom in or zoom out on this picture, um, either the blue or the red function has like the larger growth rate. So it depends on the measurement points that we take, um, the, basically um, how far and how accurate our extrapolated performance predictions are. So here in this case, you can see if we, uh, if we just take these uh, first few performance measurements here and we want to extrapolate performance, um, for example, for uh, 4,000 processes, um, then extra P will tell you that the red function in this case um, 
will be the bottleneck. However, if you extend the prediction for two to the power 14 processes, actually the blue function will become the bottleneck. So it always um, it depends or matters and in which context you are taking a look at the models. So how do we rank the kernels actually? That's pretty simple. Um, we do that according to lead order terms. So if our if one function has um, several terms, we always uh, rank according to the term that is the most important for performance and has the highest complexity. And we do that according to this big O notation. So for example, um, uh, linear runtime becomes becomes before like a polynomial. And um, then let's continue with um, an example how we actually measure and use extra pain. So like I said before, um, of course, first we need the performance measurements. Um, there are actually different ways to collect these measurements. And uh, one of them would be score P for the ones that are already familiar with score P is uh, basically a tool that lets you automatically instrument um, your entire parallel code and each function of it, and then produces a cube file output that we can directly read with extra P. However, there are also other profiling tools like HPC Toolkit, um, but we can also do uh, manual or ad hoc measurements and um, write the data to, for example, text files or other formats and read them with extra P. That's also possible. So what kind of measurements do we require for extra P? Uh, so for each, each parameter that we want to model, um, we require at least five different measurement points. Um, so for example, here, if we want to model runtime as a function of the number of processes, we need at least, at least five measurement points. So for example, here, P1, 256, 512, and so on. And using these five points, then we can create a performance model and uh, make prediction, for example, to extrapolate the performance for two to the power of 11 processes, for example. What we also do then is um, we uh, repeat each measurement that we take at each measurement point multiple times. Uh, so instead of just having um, one measurement for um, each metric, we want to have multiple because as you can see here, if we measure um, the different points several times, we see actually there's quite a variation in performance due to um, different types of noise on the clusters. Um, using these um, multiple repetitions, um, we can first identify um, a rough estimate of the noise level in our measurement and use that to later improve the modeling accuracy. And of course, we can also um, we can remove uh, outliers and we can use statistical values such as a mean or a median. Um, runtime, for example, and um, create our models based on that. And it will help us to create much better um, and more accurate performance models than just having one measurement. Of course, again, like I said before, we do some statistical quality control. Um, therefore, we take a look at the confidence interval. Um, so at the how well our extrapolated or our function will fit the measurement points that we conducted. And we basically take a look um, how well the fit is. So we want, basically we want to have an optimal fit, but on the other hand, um, we do not want overfitting on the measurement points because that also could reduce our extrapolation accuracy. And basically the solution uh, for that is what I said before is we want to conduct several measurements of each measurement point um, 
so you can get a better idea of the confidence interval. Then um, we, for example, use the adjusted R square value. So usually in statistics, the R2 value represents how well um, our function um, fits the measurement data that we conducted. Um, we introduced this uh, adjusted R2 um, value because it also uh, considers the number of terms used um, for our function. So now, of course, like I said before, um, our model can have several terms using these building blocks, for example, logarithmic block, a constant or polynomial block. Um, now, of course, we can um, always increase the number of terms each model has. However, that doesn't really help with uh, improving extrapolation accuracy. And even on the other hand, it will make it more difficult for the um, user to understand them. So that's why we reward basically models that are simple and have uh, less terms over complicated models. And um, in general, we can say that the model that has a R square, adjusted R square value higher than 0 0.95 um, fits the measurement data really well on one side, but also has a extrapolation, a really good extrapolation accuracy. If we have um, if we have models actually with a value of one, uh, often it already indicates that we are overfitting on our measurement point data. Of course, we can also um, model multiple um, parameters with extra p. So far, I was just talking about uh, process count. Um, we we called it uh, p here, but the variable names actually don't matter for extra p. You can call your variable variables whatever you want. And um, other um, variables that we usually analyze with extra p are, for example, the problem size, um, or the, uh, the order of a solver, um, or we have a result precision, for example. So multiple parameter analysis possible. And um, the only thing we need to do that for that is um, we need to expand uh, our performance model normal form. Um, so for that reason, we uh, introduce another product formula here so um, that we can actually have multiple parameters basically per, um, per term. And um, using this notation, we can again have um, simply constant functions, constant function with similar parameters, and then with multiple parameters, we can have um, either additive terms or multiplicative terms. Um, we need these um, in case, um, so either uh, application behavior, depending on the, on the parameters could be compounded or they could be independent of each other. So maybe the number of process and the problem size um, interact with each other, but maybe they don't. So that's why we need these different uh, combinations here. And then of course, we can also have uh, more complex combinations basically. Um, based on these building blocks, again, we um, create our search space. And of course, now the search space will be bigger, but the rest functions as um, for the single parameter option. So for our last and current release of extra P, we, we introduced another thing um, that we call sparse modeling. So of course, the performance experiment um, that we require you for extra P to do uh, can be sometimes be quite expensive. Um, we, we're aware of that, and that's why we um, created this approach to reduce the amount of necessary performance measurements, basically. So, so far, we always needed, basically, uh, a full matrix of measurement points for the, param for the parameters that you want to model. 
So as I said before, we needed at least five measurement points per parameter. So if we wanted to model two parameters, as you can see here in this example, the processes and the problem size, we actually needed um, this um, square matrix here of 25 points where you had to measure all uh, 25 measurement points and then also do repetitions additionally. So in the end, maybe you would, would have like 125 um, different configurations that you need to um, measure the performance of your applications, basically, including the repetitions. And of course, that can become quite costly. And another problem is that you might run to run into if you want to um, profile your application, let's say for a small number of processes, but for a large problem size, you could in, run into memory issues. So maybe you don't have enough memory um, on one node or the application runs through so fast if you're using a large number of processes and a small problem size that you're actually measuring just um, jitter, system jitter. Uh, so for that, we created this new sparse modeling approach. And what it does basically is um, we can simply model using less points. So instead, now we only need um, five measurement points um, per um, parameter. So for example, we need for the number of processes, we need these uh, black filled circles down here just five of them. And then for the problem size, we use these um, gray filled um, squares, um, another five measurement points. And then of course they can also overlap each other. So for two parameters, instead now we just need um, basically nine measurement points instead of 25 before. Um, of course, now um, we can take um, again additional measurement points. Uh, these nine points are just the minimum requirement now for our modeling approach. Of course, the more measurement data that we have, the better the models will be. So therefore we came up with a heuristic strategy. Um, we also um, evaluated this strategy using um, deep learning and uh, reinforcement learning agent. Um, but basically the simple heuristic strategy that we came out is actually, we can always start with measuring the minimum amount of required points for modeling. So for these two parameter examples, that would be nine and then create our uh, performance models using extra P. And then depending on either, if we still have budget um, for our performance measurements, um, we can keep um, going and gather additional measurements. Um, then again, use the measurements to create new models with extra P. Then we can evaluate them against the previous models to check if we actually improve in um, our um, accuracy or statistical quality control values against our measurement data. And um, if that's the case, and we still have budget, we can keep going. Or if we run out of budget, um, or we do not see further improvement after taking, let's see, two or three additional measurement points, basically we found our final model. So we did, like I said, a few uh, things to analyze this sparse modeling um, approach. So for example, um, for a synthetic data analysis, in average, we could uh, reduce the modeling cost basically by 85% and retain 92% of the modeling accuracy. Um, for case studies that we did, um, for example, faster, some fluid uh, dynamic simulation from TU Darmstadt, we could increase the actual modeling cost by 70%. So that means we could, um, we could uh, decrease um, the required budget that we needed for um, conducting these performance measurements by 70%. And in the end, we just had like 
2% less accuracy on our models. Um, then for other applications, uh, for example, Kripke from Lawrence Livermore, um, we tried uh, to see how far we can uh, push basically the sparse modeling approach. So we were able to just use a minimal, um, absolutely minimum requirements and decrease the cost by 99%. However, that resulted into a larger prediction error. So there we suffered like 40% accuracy. But on the other side, you can see that we really can just use 1% of the cost to get already a first idea about the scaling uh, models. I mean, um, here the accuracy is more about um, extrapolation accuracies on specific points, but if you just want first of all to get a basic idea about the scaling trends of your application and its specific kernels, then I would say just using 1% of the previous modeling budget is really um, great basically to get a first idea. Um, so now I would like to show you how to use the latest um, release version of extra P and go deeper into its functionality and actually what you can do with it. Um, for the latest release of extra P, um, we completely rewrote it and uh, implemented in Python. So therefore, um, for you to install it, it currently requires Python 3.7 or a higher version. And we have a few um, dependency, Python dependencies um, that are NumPy, PyCube XR, which is, um, if someone is interested in that, our own um, Python version implementation of a cube file reader, basically. And um, Marshmallow, TQDM, and PySide, and Matplotlib for the um, GUI. And as you can see, there's also dependency for uh, Mac OS for the GUI. So I can already tell you also the GUI version and the command line versions are all working on Windows, uh, Linux, and Mac OS. For Linux, we tested it on Ubuntu, but it should also work on other distributions as well. So installing extra P is uh, really, really simple. Since it's a Python package, you can just install it via uh, pip, the internal Pyth the Python uh, package manager. So you just need to run uh, this Python minus M install extra P. And then with upgrade, you can force uh, installing a new version of it. And all of the dependencies basically will be installed automatically. So. Uh, you don't need to think about installing any of these dependency actually is uh, in most cases uh, stuff like numpy you will have it installed anywhere already on your system so for extra p we have um, two different versions basically the first one is just called extra p and the other one is called extra p GUI. so if you install the python package on your system you can open like a git bash or you can just open your terminal and simply type extra p to run the command line version and for the GUI just need to type extra p slash GUI. Um, the reason why we have two different versions is the following. So first, um, maybe on your laptop you want to use a graphical user interface version and explore the charts and uh, plots that we feature in that version. But on the other hand, um, the command line version is great basically to work on the cluster. So if you conducted your measurements and you just want to get like quick and dirty, like fast, some first models, you can just fire up extra P using command line and different input formats and uh, directly get the information. You also get the same information from both tools. The only thing the command line version doesn't feature, of course, are the, um, the plots and their graphic uh, visualization of it. So how does the automatic performance modeling work of extra P? Um, of course, again, like I said many times now, first we need our measurement data. So therefore we will instrument our application, in this case, this myapp.cpp, we can instrument it, for example, with a tool such as SCORE-P. Um, 
if we do it with score p, it works great together with extra p. Um, since score p will automatically instrument all functions of an application and um, create these uh, cube performance files. Um, also call these performance profiles or measurements. And um, it uses a certain notation for that. So as you can see here, usually you will have um, the name of the application and then maybe you want to name it something like weak or strong so that you can remember that you conducted weak scaling experiments, for example. And then we have the parameter, for example, the number of processes and uh, values, so 128 in this case, and then R and uh, repetition number. So like I said, we want to conduct um, several measure measurements at several measurement points, and then also several repetitions of them. And then extra P will read all of these uh, QBEX, these performance profiles from score P automatically using our own implementation of the cube file reader in Python internally and uh, create the models for all of the um, instrumented functions. And using the command line, basically, we will get a textual based result like it's shown here. And uh, with the graphical user interface version, we will also get these models, but of course we get also um, graphical presentation. So let's uh, take a look at how we can model um, sets of cube experiments from uh, score P. So basically the modeling tool expects uh, cubes files to follow a certain format. Like I already said before, um, usually we have some directory name and a prefix. The prefix could be your application name. And um, then we have a postfix, uh, which is constructed of the parameter and its values. So in case we have several um, parameters, we would have not just X and then the value here, but maybe Y and another value, etc. And then always uh, these are dot separated and we have the number of repetitions as well. Um, what we simply do to load the cube files with extra P is we have this um, selection menu here where you can select which input type you have. So in this case, open set of cube files. And then in the next step, um, extra P wants us to um, select by basically um, the scaling type. So this would be either weak or strong. And um, after clicking on OK, it will automatically uh, generate all of the performance models, which brings us to the visualization part of extra P. Um, so in the picture here, you can see basically the basic user interface of extra P. So starting from left to right, on the left side here, we have a call tree exploration view, and that lets you take a look at the models that we created, the call paths, etc. Then we have in the middle here, uh, a plot view that allows you uh, to have a graphical representation of the created models and compare several models with each other. And on the right side over here, we basically have a, a model uh, generator panel that uh, lets you allow to choose different model generators and also for experts or advanced users, adjust the options that we use for creating the models. So let's take a closer look at the uh, call tree view. So as you see, there are many things going on here. So first of all, um, since we have this nice integration with score P, of course, score P cannot just measure one performance metric such as runtime, but it can measure actually many metrics, um, including counters, uh, floating point operations and other thing. And as we directly load all of this data into extra P, we create performance models for all of these metrics. So therefore we have um, in the top here, we have uh, um, 
basically a function where we can select the metric that, are, that we are currently viewing or analyzing. And we also have um, one here where we can select the models that we're currently working with, but that will get more important later. So depending on the metric that we selected, we see um, basically the created models for this metric and in, in this example here now runtime. And we will see the entire call tree. So meaning all functions uh, that were instrumented with uh, score P or that we instrumented manually. And we also have this uh, call tree here that we can close or go deeper into depending on uh, what we want to analyze. So you can see we can either um, analyze them specific really specific areas of, of our code or we also have basically one model for the entire functions which would be this uh, parallel model here in this case um, then of course we just not have this call tree with our function names but we also have of course the uh, created models which you can see here in this uh, value row uh, column and um, then we have other columns for the statistically uh, control values. So like RSS, um, our adjusted R2 value that again says how well our created model fits the measurement data that we have. So you see a lot of them here have a value of one. So it would indicate that they fit the measurement data really well. And then if we have other values such as relative error and so on. Um, then the finally what we also have is on the left side here this uh, indicate this color indication bar um, and this color bar basically shows you the severity of uh, this specific kernel's impact on overall application performance and this one works together with this um, slider that we have down here that basically allows us um, to change the asymptotic behavior that we are analyzing. So we can move this slider um, to set here the uh, variable value, for example, for the number of processes, which is P here in all of our models. And then we can change basically the asymptotic behavior. And based on that, the color here in this color bar will change so we, we will see, um, depending on which number we are viewing here, uh, which function will be um, basically the important one or the bottleneck in our code that we need to analyze. Um, okay, let's come to the, to the modeling view. So depending on the model we can for example select in our call path here a model um, like this evaluation function here and if we select it it will show up in our uh, plotting view over here so the view of course shows you the functions that are currently selected you cannot just select one but several functions and um, compare them to each other then it also shows you the measurement values um, displayed by this black dots here. And it can also show you uh, different uh, measurement values. It can show you all of the measurement values. It can show you just the medians. It can show you the ranges, etc., The min, the max values and so on. And then in the bottom, we have um, uh, the scale control for our X axis. So we can type here also the number of processes that we want to analyze maximum. And then uh, we can basically, our function will change based on that. And we uh, can see how well it scales for a specific number of processes. So now what we can also do is we can um, model um, performance measurements based from text files. So in case we do not um, use um, SCORE-P or maybe we can't use SCORE-P um, to instrument our function, then we can use make use of our text-based input file. So 
So therefore, again, we have another um, we have another input format here. So you simply click on Open Text Input in the GUI version, and then um, we can load a text file. So um, therefore, first you need to know how our text-based input format works like. So um, basically, it has the same, not the same structure, but it features the same information that a cube file would feature. And um, the structure for it is pretty simple. So we always have a param parameter in front here. So first, um, we need to define a parameter name, in this case, p. And then we define basically the measurement points second. So in this case, we have five measurement points and the values for each of them. And after that, we define the metrics that we use. So, and the region. So the metric would be, for example, runtime. Uh, we can have several metrics. Um, therefore, we can just either write metric here one and then comma separate the different values or we write it several times and just write the different metrics. Um, the same goes for the region. Um, the region name basically is um, the call path name also. So main, foo, bar, etc. And um, if we write the regions under each other, extra P will also um, basically directly recognize some kind of call path um, hierarchy. Uh, so it will actually format this call tree so you can open and close it down. Of course, um, this is a little bit laborious to do. Um, if you want something like that, then it's much easier to do it with score P, of course. And finally, of course, we need to um, write down our measurement data. So therefore, we have this um, data uh, tag that we write. And then after that, we basically... Um, write down our data points. The important thing, of course, now is uh, this first um, uh, data values over here will belong to the first measurement point that we uh, specified. And the multiple values here are standing basically for the repetitions uh, that we conducted. So in this case, we have five repetitions for each measurement points. However, we don't need to have five, so it could be also just three or four values for um, one data point here that would be also fine. So continuing like that, uh, the second data point here stands for the second measurement point and for the third, the fourth and the fifth, so on. And um, that's how our text-based format works. So now for the command line tool, um, basically it features the same functionality. Um, instead of opening the GUI um, version, we just run extra P in the command um, line or in the terminal. And um, just running extra P itself will do nothing. It will just uh, print you a help window with the um, different options that we have. In order to actually create some models and interpret some measurement data, uh, you need to select the input type that you want to open and provide the path to the um, input file. So for example, we uh, use extra P minus minus text um, to open a text-based file format and then provide the path to this uh, input file. And as I said before, we um, feature the input from the score P in this case, you have to use minus minus cube to open uh, cube uh, performance profiles. And um, we also have, a, for example, a JSON uh, based input format if you prefer something like JSON over a text based file format. So, um, and then the output. After running this command, extra P um, will print you the following output into the terminal. So first of all, of course, we will have the call paths. So we will get this output for each call path and each metric for this call path. 
basically. Um, so in this case, our call path would be compute and the metric would be runtime. And then again, we get the different measurement points displayed that were used uh, to create this model. And um, we also get the mean and median value for our metric here, in this case, runtime, that we used to create the model. Then of course, we, create, we get the created model. Um, this is the model that has the best fit for this measurement data automatically. And we get some statistic quality control such as RSS and the adjusted R2 that will again explain how well this model fits the measurement data. So um, if you have any feedback for XRP or any, first of all, if you have any questions now, please feel free to ask. And also, if you have feedback for extra P or you would like to use it um, or find any bugs while using it, you can always contact us at this uh, specific email list that we have here. And one of the developer will try to help you. And of course, you can also check out our tool on GitHub, like I said, or use the issues tool there if you have any questions regarding extra P.